In 1971, in the basement of the psychology department of Stanford University, a mock prison was created. It rivaled all social psychology experiments in controversy. Shortly after I finished this Stanford prison study, Milgram embraced me and said, I'm so happy that you did this. He said, he said because now you can take off some of the heat that, that he's had to bear a load of having done the most unethical study. Although this experiment is over 30 years old, its enduring power has been underscored by the events at Abu Ghraib. When we got to Abu Ghraib, it was eerie. People were being told to rough up Iraqis that wouldn't cooperate. I mean, they're torturing, they're abusing detainees. You're looking at this, the situation thinking, they've condoned this, but why? And if it wouldn't have been for those photos, no one would have ever believed what was going on over there. When I first saw the pictures, immediately a sense of familiarity struck me because I knew that I had been there before. I'd been in this type of situation. I knew what was going on in my mind. The photographs were strikingly familiar to the photographs that we had taken, many of the photographs I had taken in the prison study. We didn't do any of the stuff as you see in Abu Ghraib where they, you know, get into a big pile or something like that. But I certainly subjected them to all kinds of humiliations. I don't know where I would have stopped myself. Given enough time, we could have got there. When the images of the abuse and torture in Abu Ghraib were revealed, immediately the military went on the defensive saying, it's a few bad apples. When we see somebody doing bad things, we assume they're bad people to begin with. But what we know in our study is there are a set of social psychological variables that can make ordinary people do things they never could imagine doing. At Abu Ghraib, ordinary people perpetrated extraordinary abuses. To understand why, it helps to reach back to the lessons of Zimbardo's experiment, how people respond to a cruel environment without clear rules. I think he and everybody else who came down into that situation got caught up into that situation. And the sense that this was an experiment, that began to fade away. It became just life. We frankly didn't anticipate what was going to happen. And we tried to really test the power of the environment to change and transform otherwise normal people, much as Milgram had changed or transformed otherwise normal people in an obedience situation. We wanted to do it in a prison-like situation. Over 70 men volunteered for Zimbardo's experiment. And they completed a battery of psychological tests. We picked two dozen, 24, who were the most normal and most healthy. Half are going to be guards, half are going to be prisoners. And it's like flipping a coin, and heads, this one's a guard, this one's a prisoner. So at the beginning, there's no difference in the kinds of people who are in your two groups. When we were given our jobs as uh, guards, we were issued a uniform, which was a plain sort of khaki uh, or lighter colored uniform. And then we gave them the symbols of power, uh, handcuffs, a whistle, a big billy club. And then the other thing we gave them were silver reflecting sunglasses. When you have mirror sunglasses on, then nobody can see your eyeballs. I think that any time you put on what essentially is a mask and you mask your identity, then it allows you to behave in ways that you would not behave if you didn't have the mask on. Sir, I'm Officer Fisher. Can I help you? To make it more realistic, I had arranged with this Palo Alto Police Department to make mock arrests. When I was arrested, it was a surprise to me. I didn't think I was going to be brought to an actual police station. I didn't think I was going to go through a booking process. The guards then put a blindfold on them, stripped them naked, and then they put them in dresses, smocks with no underpants. Each had a number that replaced their name. They had to know the number. They, they could only be referred to by that number. And they had a chain on one foot, which was put there to remind them at all times of their loss of freedom. So all of these things produces a sense of being dehumanized. 
on the first day, I said, this is not going to work. I mean, the guards felt awkward giving orders, and they'd say, okay, line up, repeat your numbers, and the prisoners start giggling. Hey, I don't want anybody laughing. Three, two, one. And then a very interesting thing happened. Dave Eshelman, who the prisoner's named John Wayne, like he's a Wild West cowboy, he begins to be more extreme. I decided that I would become the worst, most uh, intimidating, uh, cruel prison guard that I could possibly be. I was sort of fascinated myself that people were believing the act, and I was trying to see how far I could take it before somebody would say, okay, that's enough, stop. We did have to do things like push-ups. Uh, we would have to sing things. At the beginning, we protested some of the actions. We did things to irritate the guards. If I gotta be in here, I'm not gonna put up with any of your shit. So the guards' authority was challenged right off the bat. And the guards had to decide how they were gonna handle that. And they had to decide it without our input. I mean, again, this was not a Milgram study in which we were standing over them telling them what to do. And they began to see the prisoners' behavior as a kind of an affront to their authority. And they began to push back. We would ramp up the general harassment, just sort of crank it up a bit. Nobody was telling me I shouldn't be doing this. The professor is the authority here. You know, he's the prison warden. He's not stopping me. Sir, put down the camera, sir. Sir, put down the camera. Sir, you can put the camera down, sir. I need to see some identification. There was the first evening, a kind of rebellion that took place. The prisoners rebelled. They barricaded themselves in their cells and said, we refuse to come out. They took off their numbers. They didn't want to be de-individuated. They started cursing the guards to their face. And the key, the key turning point was the guards began to think of them as dangerous prisoners. And so the guards formulated a plan, used fire extinguishers, took the doors down, dragged the prisoners out, stripped them naked, and essentially broke the rebellion in a purely physical way. From that point on, the study was as remarkable a series of events as I've ever seen. Sir, if you do not show you do not show me identification, sir. I am going to place you in apprehension until I can identify you. Do you understand? What crime do you suspect me of committing? Sir, it's a federal statute not to control a, v a access point. Quote you're, the, quote you're recording a federal access point. Quote the statute. Sir, if you do not identify yourself, you will be placed up and be apprehended this time. Are you military police? Sir. You have no jurisdiction outside of your base. Sir. Walk away. I'm not walking away, sir. We are on federal grounds right now, sir. You need to learn the federal grounds for this post. Sir, you will be apprehended if you do not put down the camera, sir, and identify yourself. It was a real laboratory for Zimbardo and I to watch human nature transformed in a very rapid way uh, in the face of a very powerful situation. People really suffered. I mean, guards did terrible things to the prisoners. They punished them by putting them in solitary confinement, which was a small closet. You could squat or stand, but you, know, you couldn't sit. And it was dark and, and uh, dank, actually. Every hour, every day, there's a teeny little bit more of an increment. And they're stepping up, taunting the prisoners. They're stepping up, the Count's not letting them sleep. They're stepping up. I don't think from one minute to the next, the people who are in it see the change and see the difference. And then the next key thing happened beside the rebellion, prison 8612. He was the first one to have an emotional breakdown. Am I being detained? Sir? Am I being detained? You need, you need to put am the I, camera down, sir, am I being identify yourself, Am sir. I being detained? You are videotaping a federal access point. Am I being detained? You need to turn the camera off, sir. Am I being detained? 
Sir, you need to turn the camera off. And am show I being me some identification? Am I being detained? We haven't. I haven't crossed that point yet, sir. I'm am I? If I'm not being detained, I'm free to go. Am I being detained? Am I being detained? Fisher, am I being detained? Am I being detained, Fisher? At the time, if you would question me about the effect I was having, I would say, well, you know, they must be, they must be a wimp. They're weak or they're faking. Because I wouldn't have believed that what I was doing could actually cause somebody to have a nervous breakdown. It was just us sort of getting our jollies with it. Let's let's be like puppeteers here. Let's make these people do things. What if I told you to get down in that boat and fuck the boat? What would you do then? The guards now began to escalate their use of power. Some of them had prisons clean out toilet bowls with their bare hands. They now taunt, humiliate, degrade the prisoners in front of each other, and they exert arbitrary control over the prisoners. They keep thinking of more and more unusual things to do. And very soon after the fourth day, things begin to turn sexual. You be the bride of Frankenstein, and you be Frankenstein. I want you to walk over here like Frankenstein and say that you love the man. If you want to f fully sort of humiliate somebody, then you want to get them in, the, in those things that they're, the, where their biggest fears are. And a lot of us have a lot of sexual hang-ups, and so that was part of that effort to humiliate them even further. Sir, you need to put the camera down. Am I being detained? Sir, you put the camera down. Am I being detained? 200, 220. If I'm not being detained, am I free to go? Since you have not told me that I'm being detained, I'm going to assume that I'm free to go. Do not shoot me. I'm going to go and push that button. I have no aggressive 200, intentions. 220. Failure to identify. Permission to go hands on. Oh. Get up, I love you, Joe. I love you, Joe. You're my Joe. Who gets out here and gets head push up? The guards knew that had the coin come up heads rather than tails, they would have had the dress on rather than the uniform on. They knew that. So they certainly knew that the prisoners who were being mistreated had done nothing wrong to deserve the mistreatment. And yet, the roles themselves were so powerful, and the environment itself was so powerful that they ended up punishing those prisoners as though they had done something wrong. Sir, you need to identify yourself, sir. Sir, you need to identify yourself. Am I being detained? Sir, you're going to be detained at this point for failure to okay, identify. Okay, let me put this down. Let me put this down. Don't right, turn off any cameras. Don't, Don't turn, turn off any cameras. cameras. Don't turn off any cameras. You're being detained at this time until we can find out who you are, sir. Why is that? Yeah. What crime do you suspect me? Don't take the cameras off. Do not take Sir? the cameras off. We were told to chant something about how he was a bad prisoner. And at the time I went along with it, I'm thinking, what does this matter? We don't believe this, but we can go along and chant it. That night he had a breakdown. Every day after that, another prisoner broke down in a similar way, Bro broke down. I mean, extreme stress reaction. Uh, we released another one on one on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Nobody who was in that study could deny that the prisoner breakdowns were genuine. They were, they were scary to see. They were upsetting to us. We, they were unexpected, but they were, they were very clearly the real thing. At some level, we understood that something was happening that we were no longer in control of. It was damaging people. We didn't quite have a grasp on what to do about it. One of the mistakes we made was that we didn't, we hadn't built in time to step back and to look at what was happening and call it what it was, which was mistreatment. Do not touch. I'm not resisting. Yes, I'm telling you, you are. I'm not resisting Sir? the detainment. I'm telling you, don't take my camera off. You can't get it off with the handcuffs on, anyways, guys. I have absolutely no intent to do any harm to anybody. Until we identify who you are, sir, for our safety and ours, you're being detained. Under what law? For your safety? Is that a law? You're failing to identify who you are, sir. Well, do you suspect me of a crime? Yeah. What yeah, crime? 
photography, what, uh, so access you, control. Hey, do you really have to have them that tight? I'd like to. Go ahead and load them up. We were caught up in the events that were that were taking place. Oh, you can keep your blankets, and 416 will stay in another day. We got three, guess one. Keep your blankets, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. On the fifth day of the study, Zimbardo invited his girlfriend, recent psychology graduate, Christina Maslach, to visit the mock prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil uh, about what was going on. And then when I was down there that evening, it really was kind of a, wow. The thing that really got to me was when some of the guards took the prisoners down the hall to the men's room. She looks out and sees a line of prisoners with paper bags over their heads, each one holding the other one's shoulder. And they're leading them down the hall. And Phil comes over and I, look, look, you know, my God, look at that. And I looked up and something about it just, you know, again, it was the dehumanizing, demeaning kind of treatment. I just, I couldn't watch it. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she's got tears in her eyes. I said, what? And she runs out. And I'm, and I'm furious, I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, look, this is, you know, I run outside, we have this big argument, I'm saying, look, this is, this is dynamics of human behavior, look, it's fascinating, the power of the situation, all of it. So I'm giving her all the psychological basis, and what kind of psychologist are you, you don't appreciate this. Um, and she said, I don't understand, you're a stranger to me, I don't understand this, how could you not see what I see? I mean, you know, you're a caring, compassionate person. I know you from all these other things. Something's gone wrong here. Don't, do not turn the cameras off. Why are you looking, why are you taking them? Make sure you're failing. Where are you taking them? Hey. I'm not resisting anything. Go with him. Do not turn off the cameras. Yep, roger. Do not delete any footage. No, right now you can't. my arms back. But they don't, head on my car. I will, but my arms don't bend that way. So right my now, arms do not bend that way. So right now your uh, cameras are being confiscated. Do no, the, the do SR. not turn them off. And then the next thing she said, which had an equally big impact, is, uh, you know, I'm not sure I want to, you know, have anything to do with you if this is the real you. And that was like a slap in the face because what she was saying is, you've changed. You know, the power of the situation has transformed you from, from the person I thought I knew to this person that I don't know. And at that moment, I said, wow, you're right. we got to end it. After only six days, Dr. Zimbardo shut down his experiment.